Good afternoon and welcome to the first in a series of seminars from the Global Brain Health Institute and respond on the topic of brain health and housing. My name is Onya Kerr and I'll be your MC for the next two hours as we hear from a range of leading brain health and housing experts who are going to be thinking about the biomedical, social design and community considerations of age adapted living. The discussions here for the next two hours will consider the relationship between brain health and the built environment and how new innovations, new thinking can help older adults live healthier and happier lives. Now, throughout the presentations and panel discussions, I encourage you, you the audience, the community to add questions or comments through the Q&A function, which I'll be monitoring at all times. The more questions that come from you, our audience, the better, because we can get more action oriented um, feedback, questions, thinking ideas, best practices. We really hope coming out of today between our experts and the audience that we can really generate lots of new thinking around age friendly and dementia friendly housing initiatives. And that hopefully the discussion here today can inform new best practices and ultimately and critically influence policy change. Now, throughout the discussions, please feel free to tweet and post across all of your social media platforms about our contributors, contributions, maybe that really resonate with you, uh, handles that you might think about using are at Respond Housing and at GBHI underscore fellows. The hashtag for the next two hours is hashtag brain health and housing. We will take a short commercial break in and around 4.15, just for five minutes so everybody can take a breather before we go in to the final panel discussion and wrap proceedings before five o'clock. Now, I will say with the speakers lined up this afternoon, you're going to go, I think, on something of a journey. You're going to see what's really involved in this truly innovative creative partnership between Global Brain Health Institute and Respond how some of their big thinking and its ambitious creative thinking, what that actually looks like in a very practical sense, you know, the real how of how this is possible. And we're going to see that from DDS architects and from examples from the Dutch healthcare system. And then we're going to, towards the end of this two hour session, really get to grips with the why, why all of this is so important when it comes to geriatricians, when it comes to researchers, carers and analysts that we'll hear towards the end. We're going to hear from one half of this partnership between Global Brain Health Institute and Respond. Ian Robertson is a clinical psychologist and neuroscientist with a unique ability to apply his research to real world problems. He is co-director of the Global Brain Health Institute. He is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Trinity College and was the founding director of Trinity College Institute of Neuroscience, as well as Dean of Research of Trinity College. Ian, will you set the scene a little bit on the partnership and this afternoon's discussions? I, I will indeed, Anya. Thank you so much for, for this. What I love about this um, meeting is that when people, we say there's a meeting of the Global Brain Health Institute with this Respond Housing Association, wonderful housing association, people go, what? Why? And that it's that superficial unlikeliness of the, the partnership here that actually makes it a sign that this is something very, very important. So let me take the small amount of time I have, I have before handing over to my dear colleague, Declan Dunn, um, to tell a story about some research in Chicago. So this was a follow-up of a couple of hundred older people who were living in Chicago and they were followed up over seven years. They were in their eighties and they were measured, their cognitive function was measured every year until they finally died. And then they did post-mortems on their brains. Now the only way to diagnose dementia really properly is by post-mortem. So they, they did post-mortems in their brains and they, they looked at how much pathology, dementia type pathologies were in their brains. They then looked at the relationship between that and their mental cognitive memory function over the seven years. Now, there was some reassurance for scientists and doctors because there was a reasonably good relationship between how much of this pathology was in the brain after they died and how they were actually mentally performing while they were alive. 
except, except for one subgroup. And that was the subgroup who had very, very rich and dense social connections. People who, in spite of all the pathology in their brain, had very rich social connections, family, community. That, see, that These connections seem to break the link or weaken the link between the disease and the brain and their performance, their cognitive performance in everyday life. So what that study tells us is that we are not the, the victims 100% of the pathologies in our brains and of the processes in our brains, the, the environments we live in have an enormous impact on whether and how these pathologies get expressed. And that's why brain health is, is, is we're dealing with a preventable, modifiable by lifestyle and by communities um, phenomenon. And that's why working with RESPOND is such an amazing opportunity for the Global Brain Health Institute, whose mission is to improve brain health, not only in people with dementia, but also in people at risk of dementia. And by working, we are going to learn so much in working with our RESPOND colleagues about how to design environments that can help weaken that link between the pathology in the brain and mental function to, to make people happier, make them cognitively functioning better and make them better, better citizens. There's many other examples I could give you of how environments directly affect the biology of our brains. But I'm going to just finish there with that e example. And I'm going to hand over to my dear colleague, Declan Dunn, to introduce uh, the other partner in this partnership. Hi Ian, great to see you and everybody else and so inspiring to hear of all the work you're doing. So whenever we talk about people and supporting people in any way, whether it's brain health, general health or dealing with people with trauma, you ask yourself, where are these people? And obviously they're in their own homes and they're in their neighborhoods and their communities. So it's quite exciting for us in response with next year will be 40 years in existence and over 6,000 homes we have bought and built over the last number of years, well, built principally. And this year we have, like today, we have 1,433 homes in construction. We'll add another 700 and we'll add this year and 900 next year. But in all of that, which is kind of, you know, they, they might or might not be big numbers to you, the most important thing is who lives there? What is this all about? What is the purpose of all of this? So our mission as an organization is to build homes, but it's also to improve lives. So our hope and wish and our mission is to have individuals who are thriving, families that are thriving and neighborhoods that are thriving. So the lived experience of the people that we're working with is hugely important to us. So we're looking at the outcomes for people, what trajectory they're on, what they have experienced in their life thus far, because obviously we're dealing with all of the age groups, though we have a very substantial number of older people being around for the number of years we're in, people have aged. So we provide a whole range of other services in addition to providing the homes and of course maintaining those homes and they're lifetime homes so maintenance and asset management would be huge for us and we've no shortage of you know 26 people in our architects planners and quantity surveyors department lawyers quanti you know surveyors doing all of the maintenance work but in addition to all that bricks and mortar stuff in terms of the human impact and the people involved we also run with our own staff 17 early education and child care services because we're interested in the social and emotional development of children and families. We run family support services and the minister mentioned our work in homeless services. We're not the biggest homeless services provider. We run six 
services, emergency accommodation programs here in Ireland. But we'd like to think that we're working in a way that really assists people depending on what they've gone through and moving them on very quickly. So on average, people move out of our services within six and a half months into lifetime homes. We also provide support for program refugees who've come in from Syria many of whom unfortunately have had all of those terrible experiences of war and trauma and torture to support them as they settle here. And then importantly for this discussion, we also run elder care services for people who are at that later stage in their lives and have significant um, requirements. And those services uh, provide two things. They provide support for those people who come in one or two days a week and get nurse-led services and all kinds of other supports, um, but also their carers who are, who are 24 hours a day, seven day a week carers get that little break to do that. So this collaboration is about us getting the support from the Global Brain Health Initiative to look at how can we help older people and aging people in our communities to thrive. So there's very practical things we're doing in this partnership. So there's five I'll mention here that we're actually involved in now. Um, so the first thing is we've had a substantial number of our staff trained by GBHI fellows in brain health. And as part of the initiative of GBHI to build the Brain Academy, and we hope to be a partner going forward in the Brain Academy. Secondly, we'll be hearing soon from Fiona and Greg, who are amazing architects, who are going to give a specialist architectural contract services for us in 101 apartments that we're building in our own head office location. So that will allow an opportunity to actually apply the practical steps in the building environment and in the neighborhood to assist people who are aging and those who suffer dementia. The next item we're working on is, is with GBH fellows to adapt our elder care services buildings. And we'll hear how that's um, best done later on in this afternoon. And then in addition to that, there's this seminar series. So we're committed to supporting the promotion of brain health among our staff, our communities, and in the housing sector, and with our colleague organizations to work closer with GBHI, both nationally and internationally. And then finally, we're at an early stage of discussing a pilot development of housing, where instead of people going into traditional um, nursing home services, there would be nursing home services located in a community with independent housing linked to those services so people could stay in their own home with their own integrity, their own sense of agency, but with the support on site. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Declan, Don, for those introductory remarks. And as everybody knows, Declan is the Chief Executive Officer uh, with Respond, and you'll know him from many other experiences and impactful work with Sophia Housing Association, North Dublin Development Coalition, Ballymun Generation Board, and the Housing Alliance. So thank you for that, Declan. And you heard earlier from Ian Robertson, who is the co-director of Global Brain Health Institute. We will hear again from Ian and Declan when we come to our Q&A shortly. And just a reminder on that, the Q&A function, please do use that to put in questions, comments, feedback as we go through this session uh, between now and five o'clock. So we heard there are the ambitious, amazing opportunities here, what collaboration looks like between these two organizations. So on a very practical level, what does it look like if we are designing and creating these enabling environments to help people with dementia so that they have greater independence, dignity, improved health and well-being? And joining us now to talk us through some of these practical, creative examples are Greg and Fiona Walsh. And Greg and Fiona are the co-founders of DDS Architects. They're specializing in evidence-based dementia inclusive design, where they design aesthetically beautiful buildings and interiors that are enabled for people living with cognitive, sensory, or physical impairments. And then people who are in later life, they've completed the Atlantic Fellows Program at GBHI in 2019 where they advanced the understanding of the relationship between brain health and architecture. 
Greg and Fiona advocate on the topic of dementia inclusive design with the Irish and UK governments. They've worked with the World Health Organization, World Dementia Council, LSE, NHS, HSE, NDO, ADI, Irish Dementia Working Group. These guys are busy. Please, Greg and Fiona, take it away with your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, that saves me one of my slides anyway, so I appreciate that. Um, one thing I, I would just like to draw is, I'm not personally an architect. I actually came out of the pharmaceutical medical device industry. And my whole world was about developing drugs and devices to have better outcomes. And it was all evidence-based uh, outcomes. And we would develop drugs to improve people's lives. And Fiona is, she's an architect and she is a fellow in brain health and a fellow in architecture. And she's also a practicing chartered architect. And you might gather from the accents or you'll hear Fiona in a moment, we're both Irish, but we're living in the UK at the moment. When we were asked to talk today, um, the word quality jumped into my mind. It hasn't on any of our other presentations, but today it did for some reason. And when I look at quality, it's about fitness for purpose. That's the simple definition of quality. And if we think about it, if we boil all of the uh, quality standards and quality awards and quality marks and everything that we have within the building industry, the most simple question I ask is, is our built environment fit for purpose for the people who live, it, live in there and actually use the actual environment. And that's the most fundamental quality standard. And I just don't see that at the moment. So Fiona and I work for uh, greater equity and brain health, and we are really privileged and honored to be uh, fellows of the Global Brain Health Institute. And we want to ensure equal access to home, community, healthcare, social care, human rights, dignity, independence, and autonomy for people living with brain health challenges. So if we actually look at Article 9 of the UN Convention on, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it requires countries to identify and eliminate obstacles and barriers and ensure that persons with disabilities can access their environment, transportation, public facilities, and services. If we look under Article 19, it recognizes the rights of all persons with disabilities to live independently and be included in our community. And I think as a society since the 1990s, we have made great strides in moving forward in supporting people with physical impairment access our built environment. I still do think we have a way to go, but we have made great access since the, our great progress since the 1990s. But when we start thinking about people living with cognitive and sensory impairment, we have made very little progress in actually understanding, first of all, the impact of the built environment on people with cognitive and sensory impairment. And then secondly, not, not building the environment to actually be inclusive for people with cognitive and sensory. So who in Ireland is actually affected? If we think about the group, I put a short list together of cognitive and sensory impairments, and this is not comprehensive. You could double, triple this list without any bother. And if you start looking at, in Ireland, there's over 380,000 people on this list from hearing, ADHD, dementia, sight impairment, autism, stroke survivors, Parkinson's, traumatic brain injury, intellectual disability, and then if you look at the actual census in Ireland, we've seen that there's 600,000 people with disabilities in Ireland. Now, one of the weaknesses in this piece of data is we don't really capture cognitive impairment within this number. We do capture a bit of sensory, but mainly this is physical impairment. And then if we look at the over 65s in Ireland, 630,000 people over 65, and by 2051, that's going to grow to 1.6 million people. And the thing they all have in common is they all have degrees of cognitive sensory and or physical impairment over time. So why do we focus on dementia? Dementia inclusive design is the most 
inclusive form of design as people with dementia can live with progressive compounded physical, sensory and or cognitive disabilities. And this is gonna make sense in a few minutes when I start talking through the brain and the impact of dementia or of uh, Alzheimer's. So at the moment, do we actually understand the impact on our environment? So if we take Mrs. Smith is living at home with support, she's got some minor memory loss, she's independent. She has a urinary tract infection or she has a fall. She ends up going into the emergency department or accident and emergency. And in the UK and Ireland, and I'm sure in plenty of other countries, we have this compulsory four hour wait in quite a hostile environment with bright lights, noise, reflective surfaces, uh, all sorts of uncertainty within that environment. And we end up with a sensory overload. And Mrs. Smith starts to display, you know, with developed stress, anxiety, and sometimes even fear, depending on what the environment is like, and starts to display some behavioral challenges within that. She's very agitated. She also doesn't want to leave her seat because she might lose her place in the A&E department and she doesn't know whether she missed her chance to be seen by the doctor or not. So she doesn't use the water fonts, she doesn't eat anything, she becomes dehydrated and that further exacerbates her stress and anxiety and some of the behavioral challenges that she starts to exhibit. So by the time the junior doctor comes along to see her, the doctor can't distinguish between the UTI or the fall between that and the stress and anxiety that Mrs. Smith is actually displaying in the A&E. So what does the doctor do? The safe thing to do is actually admit her to hospital. And the challenge with that is our hospitals today are not designed to support functional ability. They're designed to save lives. They're designed for younger people. They're designed for acute interventions. But actually there's a lot of people that experience rapid functional decline especially people with cognitive and sensory impairment and older people. And what happens is the individual starts to lose confidence in their abilities, their ability to cope when they're in hospital after a couple of days. The family starts to lose confidence in that person's ability to cope and the doctor loses confidence in the person's ability to cope. So what we see is that 40% of people previously diagnosed with dementia are discharged to a care home. And when we discharge somebody to a care home, unfortunately, our care homes are not actually set up and designed again to support functional ability. We're building them more like warehouses and holding uh, environments. They're very beautiful and they look nice, but actually they, they further again accelerate functional decline. And then Mrs. Smith ends up losing her dignity and independence. And we start using sedation as a way of actually controlling Mrs. Smith. So, if we look at the key facts on dementia, there's 64,000 people in Ireland, just over 64,000 people in Ireland with dementia. That's grown to grow to over 157,000 people. And that's important to remember that number in a second. The cost is 1.7 billion. It's gonna to grow to 5.1 billion. And this is not just on the health system and the social care system. This is also costs incurred by the private individual as well. 60 to 66% of people with dementia live in the community. And a lot of people don't realize this. We seem to have a, an impression that dementia equals secure unit, but actually most people with dementia are living in the community like Mrs. Smith. Up to 40% of the beds in acute hospitals are occupied by people living with dementia, diagnosed or undiagnosed. And they stay two to four times longer in hospital than somebody of a similar age and 40% are discharged, 40% of the people previously diagnosed with dementia going into a hospital are actually discharged into a care home. Now, I don't know how any society is going to cope if the numbers double and triple. So we see the global numbers are going to go from 50 million to over 150 million over the coming years. And basically what we're going to have is a huge pressure on our hospital system. And we're still building care homes and nursing homes, thinking that it's just for healthy old people. But in fact, 60 to 80% of the beds in a standard care home have people living with dementia diagnosed or undiagnosed at multiple different stages. So now let's start trying to understand what I said about progressive compounded sensory and cognitive impairment and start trying to put some 
visualize what this looks like. So when we look at Alzheimer's, it's actually the, the it accounts for about 65 to 70 percent of dementia, and it's the key disease that's driving the majority of the dementias. And it's malformed proteins, tau and amyloid, that get laid down on the brain over time in a progressive way. And when we look at it, it starts normally in the hippocampus. And as the, the, the protein lays down, it's like it's damaging different parts of the brain, like you're having a stroke in a different part of the brain. It's not the same mechanism, but it's causing damage to the brain. And you start to lose the ability of the brain where that amyloid and tau is actually laid down. So the first thing you start to lose is memory, spatial awareness, navigation, your sensory processes are, are compromised, hearing, smell, language. It then moves around to the back of the brain and your visual processing starts to um, get compromised. And if you, if you think as you age, your senses already are, are picking up weaker data than they used to when they were younger because your eyes have, are find it harder to see things and the, then your ability to process the images that are coming in is also compromised. Your color vision can comp be compromised, your depth perception can be compromised. As it moves around the brain, we start seeing spatial orientation challenges, sensory processing challenges, object classification. So as we start putting in fancier taps and uh, into public spaces or fancier seats or fancier uh, elements into different spaces, that becomes harder and harder for somebody with dementia to actually understand what they're looking at. As we move around to the front of the brain, we start looking at language expression, movement, reasoning, problem solving, judgment, planning, all of these. Balance is also affected. Now, if you had, from a, if you were in a car crash or you had a stroke and any one of these was actually impaired, like your movement or your balance, you would find it difficult to cope. And yet people with dementia are living with progressive compounded sensory and cognitive impairment. Now, the one thing as we design, we're trying to compensate for all of these different uh, areas of the brain. But one thing we're also trying to do when we design is we're trying to design to leverage the procedural memory because it's one of the last met parts that actually goes in the brain. And it's the bit where we intuitively do something. So we can design the environment to be a lot more predictable and easier to understand and routine. Therefore, people can cope easier without putting pressure on the brain. A lot of the, there's also an element whereby we design to take pressure off the working memory. And the working memory, if you think about the computers in the 1980s and the 1990s, where you had multiple windows open uh, on, um, on the screen, and suddenly you opened up one more window and the whole computer crashes. This is something similar to the way the working memory works within the brain. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to shut down the windows to open up capacity for people to be able to cope within the environment that they're actually in. And there's all sorts of elements and stressors in the environment that actually occupy and put pressure on the brain. So we design to actually try and support that. So the key thing we're actually trying to achieve through design on the vertical axis here, we see functional ability and well-being, and people remaining independent or people becoming dependent. And years depends on progression of the disease and type of disease or age or whatever. But what you see over time is a functional decline, not flip or we accelerate down. Through design, when we look at the evidence and the data and our experience, what we can do is we support functional reserve. And therefore, you're supporting independence and pushing out when people become dependent. Now we talked earlier about the hospitals. This is what's happening with the hospitals at the moment. So while they're green and while they're beautiful and while they're designed very nicely, the question I have is if we're still seeing hospital associated functional decline as a result of the environment, are we actually designing quality hospitals? And the cost to our system, it's premature loss of independence, it's increased healthcare, increased care costs, and it's also causing individuals to lose independence earlier. So with that, I'll hand over to Fiona. Good afternoon, everybody. A pleasure to be with you. And um, I'll go straight in because I think we're probably running a little bit behind time. Um, first of all, I'd like to say to you is, I think we all realize that our relationship with the environment is not passive. Individual elements within our built environment can cause anxiety, stress, and fear. And this I'm going to refer to as stressors. 
I think we've probably all experienced at some stage in our lives where we've entered in space or an environment and felt a little ill at ease. We never really stick around to find out why. It might be too noisy, it might be overcrowded, and poor lighting, it might be turning into an unfamiliar street in an unfamiliar city, but something tells us it's not quite right. And our natural reaction is to leave. This, of course, can happen to somebody on a lot more regular basis if they're suffering from a cognitive or sensory impairment, because they find it a lot more difficult to interact with the environment and decode what's happening around them. So people withdraw from spaces that make them uncomfortable, and this results in unnecessary loneliness and social isolation. This can also lead to homelessness and social exclusion. And I think what we need to realise here is that we need to take account of this, we need to understand the mechanism and understand that people may even withdraw from their own communities. And as Ian has said to us, it's very important that people stay engaged in community. People will over time withdraw from all spaces that make them feel, feel, feel ill at ease and may eventually end up isolated in their own home, in their own armchair and eventually in their own bed. Today we are building environments with stressors that can cause loss of function and extreme distress. Designing to support a sense of control and understanding. Anxious and stressed will result in increased behavioural response. This can include apathy and depression. And I think, again, we all need to have a sense of what this must be like. If we felt isolated or out of control or, or um, excluded, I think we would all have a sense or a behavioural reaction. So this isn't something that's directly associated with dementia or cognitive and sensory impairment. It's a natural human reaction. A sense of control and understanding equals calm. And this is what we need to offer people living with cognitive and sensory impairment. So inclusive design principles, what are they? Since, two, since the 1990s, we've had very clear guidance on um, building inclusive environments for people with physical impairment. In 2010, our legislation brought in a little bit of a nod towards people with um, sensory impairment. But still, we have a void where we do not have direct or clear guidance on how to design for people with cognitive impairment. And I think, as Greg has explained to you today, if we understand a little about the brain and how it functions and how every single cognitive and sensory ability helps us, helps us to interact and read our environment, any kind of damage to the brain can affect our interaction and our day to day experience with the environment. So what I suggest is that we have our technical guidance document, our understanding and our knowledge. And what we add then is we understand that we need an additional set of guidance, guiding principles that we use for people living with cognitive, sensory and physical impairment over and above our national standards and national guidance. And I think if we can educate people to understand this and they can use these principles, it will lead to a more inclusive environment for all. So what is preventing adoption of these principles and adoption of providing for people with cognitive and sensory impairment. First of all, I would say lack of awareness. I think there's a huge lack of awareness within the design community and within commissioners to understand the need that we have these people living in our communities and they have very particular needs. There's also a lack of knowledge of how to actually design to get the correct outcomes. Here we need further education. But what's also preventing adoption is we have a certain amount of knowledge which sits within healthcare and um, healthcare and community care. But what's happening here is we've got a naive interpretation of the knowledge and it's resulting in environments that are primary colours, quite gaudy and not really what we want to see in our day to day communities. People live with dignity and independence. They don't want to spend the latter years of their lives living in environments that look like primary schools. So what I would say to you is it's very possible if you have a deep understanding and knowledge to design environments that are totally inclusive and that all of the interventions are invisible to the untrained eye. We need to change the paradigm and we're doing it slowly but surely. We can design beautiful, sophisticated, stunning and comfortable environments for people to spend their years and live in comfort and with dignity. These are two schemes we've recently uh, developed and have actually been um, commissioned for a care home in County Cork. And it's completed since we had the um, COVID lockdown. So unfortunately I haven't seen the finished product, but by all accounts, it's turned out absolutely fantastic. Um, so we talked about part M. We've had this guidance and understanding since 2000, uh, the 1990s, and then again in 2010. 
And yet we're still seeing people implementing designs that look like this. Now, our guidance document requests that we have contrast and um, make, make the support elements visible. But here we can see that this environment is actually supportive of somebody with a purely physical impairment, but for somebody with a cognitive or sensory impairment, this room doesn't function correctly. For somebody with a sight impairment, they can look in and white on white is next to invisible, so it can appear as an empty room. What this leads to is people having, um, can lead to incontinence, loss of dignity, loss of independence and loss of confidence. Again, here's um, Terminal 2 Dublin Airport and here we have guidance about contrasting threads. But actually, as you can see here, we have a contrasting landing. So where does the first step start and the um, landing end? We have to understand the guidance in detail and understanding what we're trying to achieve by following guidance. There's also a lot of reflection and glare in this environment and the depth perception issue that people can suffer with cognitive and sensory. This environment is not accessible to somebody with a cognitive impairment. So disorientation. Design can support a person to understand their environment. This room could be anywhere. It could be somebody's home. It could be a care home. It could be a doctor's practice waiting room. But here you can see, again, white on white on white. It is really difficult to understand the boundaries of this room. Somebody living or standing in this room could be totally disorientated and lost. It can cause an, an immense amount of stress and fear for somebody. They can't find the exit. They don't know where the walls are. They're really disorientated and lost in this space. A similar or an identical room with the addition of colour and contrast. Here you can see it's very easy to read and guide yourself around the room. We know from talking to people with, uh, with sensory impairment that they often use the architrave and skirting to find the perimeter of the room or the ceiling plane to differentiate between the walls. So by introducing color between the different planes, highlighting the door, losing some of the glare and the reflection. Here we can see a very open room and it's very easy to interpret and read. This will add to a sense of calm. One environment is disabling through lack of contrast, the other is enabling. Now does inclusive design add additional cost? Again, this is, um, an, what we call an accessible toilet. We've seen them all, they're in hospitals, social care settings, home adaptations. And here we can see we can design an identical and provide an identical facility, but add in contrast and uh, color. And again, there's no additional cost to doing this. It's about added knowledge and understanding. And again, we talked about earlier, Greg talked about color definition and contrast and depth perception. Here they're supportive, but even if somebody loses their color definition, we actually design for light reflective values, which can be seen even in black and white. So all of this is supportive. So visual and auditory clutter, what is this? Well, actually for somebody with cognitive and sensory impairment, they lose the ability to, um, to filter out and focus on the irrelevant, on, on the relevant. We have an ability sitting in a room if something's going on in the background to be able to focus and, and filter out the background um, distraction. This is lost with somebody with a cognitive and sensory impairment or can be. So over um, emphasis on auditory or visual, the mind uh, is unable to rest and they find it difficult to focus. It can cause a sense of chaos, stress and anxiety. And as we said before, when people feel uncomfortable, they withdraw. And here you can see it is in a, a situation in a house where we wouldn't even see this as visual and, audit, uh, and clutter because actually it's things that our minds can adapt to. So things like reflections and glare are not a problem for us, but they can be a real problem for somebody with cognitive or sensory impairment. And again, things like busy environments with reverberated sound, things that we can ignore or discount are a problem for somebody with cognitive or sensory. We need to keep this in mind. So technical guidance documents, standards, confusing and contradictory. This is a sequence of doors. You come out of, a, it's in a stroke unit in an acute hospital. You come out a door here and you're immediately faced with a sequence of five doors. If somebody comes out, they may be looking for the toilet or the, the washroom. And actually they encounter five identical doors, which all have the same meaning and the same emphasis, which is what's called for our technical guidance. And actually each, these four are service rooms. So they're actually service duct covers and not doors. But we have then this door, which is a service area, which isn't open. And actually the toilet, which they're looking for is the sixth door down on the right and about 12 or 15 meters from the point of access. All of this adds to confusion, frustration, loss of dignity and loss of control. 
And what we could actually do is very simple intervention would be to camouflage the doors that aren't relevant or that are for service use only and highlight the doors that we want somebody to use. Now, there's another solution to this problem, too, which is much more um, intuitive. We need to understand that it's not just at the end and it's not just to do a colour or contrast or materials. In the master planning of this building, would it not have been so much more acceptable to actually walk out and have the toilet immediately adjacent to the ward? So you've got 15 or 20 people in this ward looking for a toilet and actually they've got to move 15 metres along. So, sorry. What could have happened is they could have walked directly outside and had the toilet ahead of them. So we talked about um, inclusive design and where is it applicable. Greg said we were looking for inclusive design in all, um, in all aspects of our built environment. We've recently been involved in some very interesting projects. We've looked at an audit of a town where we've introduced the principles into an urban setting. We've also looked at primary care centres and looked at the gap analysis between current demonstrated best practice and what we could achieve if we used inclusive design principles. We've worked with the memory technology rooms in Ireland and trained some of their staff and we've worked with the Irish Working Dementia Group. And all of these are innovative ways of projecting the understanding and knowledge into the mainstream. So just to complete here, what I'd say to you is every penny of capital expenditure not built to best practice inclusive design standards creates redundant buildings of the future, considering our, age, our aging demographic. Designing enables and inclusive environments is about informed choice and not additional cost in new buildings. And I believe we are not actually honouring our right, the rights of people living with disabilities under Article 9 and 19 of the UN Convention of Rights for People with Disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Greg and Fiona Walsh of uh, DDS Architects. It's such a compelling case on why this is needed, how it can be done, but equally really uh, insightful on some of the barriers. Um, so we'll come back maybe to some of those barriers in the Q&A. And just a reminder uh, to everybody, the Q&A function is open. We're going to be coming to Q&A with all of the speakers at four o'clock. Uh, so do have your questions coming in. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Rutger de Graaf, who works as an innovation manager in two Dutch healthcare organizations. I'm not even going to pronounce them uh, because he will embarrass my pronunciation that I tried earlier. But uh, Rutger works with more than 1,500 people. They're living, working, eating, receiving care in these centers. And they're very much functioning as testing grounds for what he's going to talk about, nature-assisted innovations. And we, we saw great innovation there from the Walches. And I think what you're going to see with, with Rutger now is more nature-assisted and, and this concept of green innovation. So please, Rutger, you're so welcome. Uh, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, I will share my uh, presentation with you. So I think this... Uh is viewable for you all. So thanks for the invitation to uh, speak to you all. I'm very excited. Um, my name is Rutger de Graaf and I work for PNMS and Het Ministernerf, but you can forget the names, of course. Uh, feel free to shoot me a LinkedIn request and um, you can uh, see the names of the organizations. I'm also uh, in the board of a um, housing organization in um, two uh, cities in the Netherlands. And um, one of the things that um, I specialize in is the uh, implementation of nature in our health system. And something that you have to know perhaps about me before I um, continue with my story, uh, I uh, have been working as an innovation uh, consultant for 20 years now. And I started like one of the previous speakers in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, I come from the city of Amsterdam where there's little nature inside. And I did not grow up with any nature. And I have to admit, I'm not very enthusiastic about walking in nature or getting my feet dirty. Um, so I spent my childhood, you know, playing video games with my friends. Uh, so I was not on the path of nature and I'm not a green enthusiast. Uh, so when this innovation for the first time uh, came onto my radar, I was very skeptical, to be honest. And I um, have to admit, I thought it was like a cute thing that probably some people would like um, and there was no, you know, there are no big disadvantages, but I was not super enthusiastic about it until I saw all of these studies 
and um, uh, they really uh, shook me because if I had a medicine that did all of those beneficial things for our health that being in a green environment does for us, and I will tell you more about that later, um, then I would be a very rich and successful pharmaceut uh, pharmaceutical company. Uh, but it's something that's free. It's available to us all. But I don't know how it's in your country, but in the Netherlands, nature is hardly or almost not at all used in a structural way in our healthcare system. So we started to uh, introduce this item in the different buildings uh, that we have. And slowly but surely, it became a more and more important and prominent feature of our healthcare system. And now there is a, um, a, a Dutch movement that tries to use more nature in our healthcare system. So I'm very proud of that. So I have some pictures to share with you. Uh, you will see all of these pictures, by the way, are from our own organization. Um, so it started basically with looking at the indoor air quality. It's a very nice hard indicator. You can put up a sensor that lets you know what the indoor air quality is. Do you know what the indoor air quality in your organization or your office perhaps, or perhaps even your home is? I didn't. And I was really shocked when I found out that in most of our nursing homes and hospitals, the indoor air quality is actually much worse than uh, you should expect in a healthy environment. Um, it kind of makes sense because we clean a lot using very severe uh, cleaning materials and they leave a residue in the air. Also in our nursing homes, we have these closed wards where there is this culture that windows are not often opened, uh, perhaps out of fear that people will you know, jump out of the window or something like that. The effect is that the indoor air quality is uh, very low. And it's actually something that you want to change if you want to have a healthy environment. Um, you can very easily change the air quality in every room, every your house or your office, not, not so difficult. You can open a window, of course, but our organizations are smack in the center of the most um, busy cities in the Netherlands. And they're also uh, close to big factories because this is the industrial center of the Netherlands. So our outside environment is also not very healthy. Um, so opening a window does something, but in our case, it was not a huge solution. But there's another way you can easily change the indoor air quality. You can buy expensive filters and all kinds of um, tech solutions that will try to solve this issue, but they break down and they come with their own you know, problems, a lot of maintenance. Uh, but plants are also really good in filtering the air. And we saw a lot of scientific studies and they were initially done by NASA, um, how plants contribute to a clean air. So we added plants to our indoor uh, environment. And very quickly, we found not only that the air was much better, but also that these plants um, reacted to the environment they were in. We start to add plants outside of our organization as well, because as I said, we live in this polluted part of the Netherlands. Um, and as you can see, uh, it actually does something to your to the picture as well. I, I really liked the previous speakers. It was a very good presentation and it appealed to me because this is also something that we find when we are working with nature. That aside from the fact that the breathing becomes easier and the uh, air quality is better, uh, you also become happier, uh, you feel more uh, relaxed. So there are a lot of mental effects as well that have been clinically proven. However, if you put plants in a typical nursing home or hospital in the Netherlands, I don't know what the, how, how it is in your country, but in our country, they quickly die because of a lack of sunlight. Uh, and that's a shame because, uh, you know, we want the plants to live, of course, but it also raises a question. Uh, if the plants die because of a lack of sunlight, how are we as human beings supposed to thrive uh, in that same situation? We are built to be outside. We are built to be in the sun. 
and we are not built to uh, live our entire lives in um, dim situations where there is only shadow. We are uh, conditioned to think that if there's enough, enough light in a, a room uh, that we are happy, it's kind of cozy. Um, but if we would actually uh, recreate the light of the sun, then it's much better for you. It's better for your sleep. It's better for your uh, whole uh, body. Um, and there are all kinds of uh, beneficial aspects of recreating the uh, light of the sun. So we start to add a biorhythmic, biorhythmic lighting that recreates uh, sunlight. Um, one of the things that biorhythmic lighting does is it changes the frequency. So in the morning, there's this blue frequency that kind of tells your body to wake up and to become alert because you have to do things and you know run away for cave bears and those kinds of things. And we also need that in our lives. And because we have busy lives, a lot to do, we have to be alert. In the evening, when the sun is setting, and there is this red frequency. And this red frequency um, tells our body it's time to go to sleep, but also to forget about all the trauma of the day, to kind of become more relaxed. So it's a very important function if we're talking about uh, relieving stress. One of the problems of modern uh, societies, of course, that you are probably aware of this, all of our devices, our smartphones, our laptops, they um, have this blue frequency. So when before you go to sleep, when you watch a streaming uh, service or uh, check your phone for something, um, you're reactivating your body, basically. Uh, you will still sleep, but the uh, um, relieving of, pres of pressure and uh, stress is uh, decreased. So it's a very interesting item that if you add sunlight, especially to nursing homes, um, we see a huge effect amongst the population. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, people that live in our houses with dementia, so it's difficult for them to really talk about what they're experiencing. So we have a lot of scientists that observe uh, the behavior of our clients. And more than 70 studies have been done into the effects of plants, sunlight, the air, and animals in our nursing homes and I will share some of those results with you in a later slide. Um, these are one of our early green walls. We also have you know, normal plants in pots, a lot of different ways you can add plants to a um, uh, to an indoor environment. This is one of our old uh, pictures because now everything has been refurbished kind of along the lines I think a bit of what uh, Greg and Fiona were talking about as well. So less shimmering surfaces. Um, if you ask a company to make a plan for you with those uh, lights, they will also look at those kinds of things, how the light is distributed, if it reflects on surfaces, those kinds of things. So we were realizing we were basically recreating nature and making our... Um, our work and, and, and living environment and natural environment. But of course, a very crucial element was still missing. Animals were not in this world alone. And this, I think, is the most dramatic aspect uh, in terms of effects of our approach. Plants are fantastic. They do a lot. Uh, the air, of course, super important. You breathe it the entire day. Um, and the sunlight also, we notice it immediately. People sleep better, they are more happy. But when we started to introduce animals, uh, our project went through the roof. Of course, it also raised a lot of questions because um, a lot of employees said, we don't want animals, we don't want to take care of animals. They will raise a lot of problems. Uh, some people have allergies, so all kinds of problems um, uh, will arise, but there are answers to all of those problems. And after a year, everyone was used to the animals and no one wants to get rid of them. Um, it's such a huge success. There are dogs, there are cats, there are cuddly uh, animals, and we have cuddle sessions with chickens and rabbits. There are also wild animals, bees that are kept by a beekeeper, uh, big projects with birds. So I want to share a few pictures with you. 
in our country, like in your country, I think uh, bees and insects have a, a very difficult life. A lot of uh, they're dying out. Uh, so we are very happy to contribute to a healthy environment for bees. And we also have free honey the entire year. Um, there are a lot of people in the Netherlands that have an interest in nature. We were kind of struggling a bit with volunteers. Uh, we didn't have enough volunteers anymore. Uh, it's difficult to find enough personnel, qualified personnel in the Netherlands to um, provide health care. Uh, so that was an increasing problem and it will remain an increasing problem. Uh, doing volunteer work in elderly care is not very popular anymore in, uh, in our country. And I heard that that is an international trend. However, when we introduced the animals to this mix of uh, natural things that we were introducing, there was a huge influx of new volunteers, especially young volunteers, that were not interested in elderly care per se, but really came for these green uh, and um, especially the animals uh, that we introduced. We thought that we, at, certainly at the beginning, we would have to take care of the animals ourselves, but it turned out that we have now a waiting list of people that want to take care of the chickens and the birds, etc. Not only that, also there were all kinds of organizations around these topics that have really found a home in our nursing homes. So they use our buildings as a place where they come together, where they have their meetings. Uh, they provide a lot of services in our house. They um, give presentations uh, and they... Um, uh, come very often to show new things, etc. So they really work closely with our activity uh, personnel. That was a huge unsuspected success. This is one of our roof gardens that we uh, that we made, um, where we see that there is a close collaboration between the animals and the, the the gardening that goes on. So we have a lot of volunteers on those topics. We now have four times as much volunteers as we did when we started with these projects. So that's an amazing uh, increase. And other organizations that have adapted this same uh, formula have found the same results. Well, more pictures of animals. This is one of our cuddle chickens here in the below. They're a special breed of chicken with a very strong maternal instinct. So when you put down your hand, they immediately walk to your hand and sit on it. I was not aware that this chicken existed. I always thought chickens were a bit scary because they remind me of little dinosaurs. But these are very fluffy chickens and they like to cuddle. We also have rabbits that like to cuddle, but sometimes you know they can be a bit fickle. So our, our personnel is also trained to take the welfare of the animals in consideration as well. Uh, we have a uh, political party called uh, the Animal Party. And uh, at first, they were a bit against uh, the introduction of animals in healthcare. Um, we do have some horse therapy and those kinds of things in the Netherlands, but not like widespread use of animals in nursing homes and elderly care. Um, but when we asked them and invited them to come, they came and we have made uh, protocols that kind of you know, give answers to all of those questions like how do you deal with the health care of the animals, the welfare of the animals. Uh, we have someone who audits the animals every month. Uh, we work in close collaboration with the Animal Protection Agency. So that means that if they have an animal that they, you know, have saved from something and they can't really find a nice place for it, they also offer it to one of our, our houses. Um, and that's a really cool collaboration because it kind of, you know, went away, all the negativity that was kind of there from some people that were concerned about animal safety went away with that. Um, and we got a lot of new volunteers as well because of that. And that brings me to the final aspect, I think, of our formula is that nature is fantastic. It brings a lot of beneficial elements to uh, the work and living environment of our organizations. However, uh, the most fantastic thing is that you can really experience it. So we added this element of play and that's, I think, really important, especially in a crowded country, an urbanized country like the Netherlands. Uh, we have kind of lost our 
connection to nature. I think you know, my own introduction could be an example of that. I didn't grow up with nature. It was really far away. I have no you know, positive associations with it. Um, I've been stung by bee when I was a child. I think that's my only association I have with nature. So this connection has been lost. But when you reestablish that connection, that brings a lot of worthwhile uh, things, even to people who think that they don't really have any uh, positive link with the natural world. The nice things of those studies is also that they found that regardless of your own interest in animals or plants, the effects are still there. But the effects are especially there if you really um, engage with the plants by gardening, those kinds of things, or with the animals, by, like walking a dog or petting, petting a cat, those types of uh, issues. We have um, asked children in our, our neighborhoods to help us with this element of play. And that was a really fun aspect of uh, this approach, because when we're talking about uh, adding play, I think children are the experts uh, and uh, that was really true. They um, did these safaris through the neighborhood, and we also started to uh, start to begin projects outside of our organization, more in the community. And this really helped getting the community into our uh, organizations. So now we have also more volunteers because of that. But also, it's easier for us to ask things to our environment. Uh, to our um, uh, neighborhood. So if we need new uh, people to work with us or if we have a question like who has any flowers to give to us, uh, then our neighborhood responds very quickly now. Before it was kind of uh, a bit a separate world, only the people that received care or their immediate family members went to our organizations. But now it's like a coming and going because we have all of these green activities. And because these children gave us all kinds of tips how we could make our buildings and the living environment more fun and you know, for everyone. Some more pictures of children playing and they play together with uh, our clients quite a lot. So I promised you an overview of these beneficial aspects of um, introducing nature in your living and working environment. More than 70 studies were uh, conducted in our organization, but uh, internationally, there are more than 10,000 scientific peer-reviewed studies done on this topic. Um, the main effects that are found are that people become more creative in a green environment. And this also works if you, um, it already starts working if you put a few plants in your office space or if you put up a really nice picture of a rainforest, those kinds of things. People feel more connected. So that's, of course, important for us because being lonely, feeling of, feeling of depression are a very important problem that we try to tackle. This was a very interesting one. People recover. Uh, more quickly from um, some diseases and also from uh, surgery. And that was that one really blew our mind. It has uh, been um, uh, statistically proven in a lot of our um, rehabilitation homes. And um, it really surprised me because uh, even today, nature is not really integrated in our recovery programs. While, you know, I don't really understand why, if we would have a pill that did this, it would immediately be uh, used by doctors. People feel more autonomous. They eat more healthy. They feel more playful. Their mood is better. They feel less stress, or perhaps we should say their stress is more relieved because that's actually what's happening. Um, they have an intention to exercise, there is always a big gap between intention to exercise and actually exercising, but still that's an effect. The breathing becomes easier and the concentration becomes better. Um, I now have a side, oops, sorry, a side project for schools uh, because they are also interested in um, kind of making little forests inside of their schools. More than 500 schools are now participating in that program. Um, perhaps you think, well, this is like a quick list 
uh, and I'm, I'm not so trustworthy. So I would like to, you know, look at those articles myself. Well, we collected a few, uh, to be precise. I collected um, 3,000. That was when we stopped. And um, let me just share a different screen for you. Uh, nope, nope, nope. There we go. Can you see this list as well? Uh, this is a list with peer-reviewed articles. So these are the articles that um, uh, those claims are based upon. Uh, they are reviews. So every article reviews approximately um, 100 scientific peer-reviewed articles. It is, uh, so these, these items are of course in, in Dutch, but the articles are, as you can see in English, most of them. So I will share that with you and um, perhaps you can kind of translate this together so uh, you, for your ease. And um, yeah, you can um, take a look at those and see if it helps you in your own path. So that was what I wanted to um, talk about with you. I wanted to have ample time for your questions because I think that's always the, the best part of every presentation. Um, so thanks for your attention. Are there any questions I might answer? Thank you, Dr. Rupert. That was amazing. I know already that infographic, um, people are asking for a copy of it. So I think there will be follow up and we'll liaise with the respond team maybe to get your references there and that infographic and, and send on. Uh, we're going to be joined now by the Walshes who you heard from earlier and from Ian and Declan. We're just going to have about five minutes for Q&A. Any questions we don't get to from the audience, we will follow up. Maybe we can get back to them in, in the Q&A towards the end. But I might come to Ian and, and Declan, and, and we'll have to be brief here, unfortunately, with the time that we have. I think that the Walshes and Dr. Ruth Bear made a very compelling case there. Uh, and I'm just wondering, looking at all of that, uh, what needs to happen at a policy, at a governmental level to turn some of the pilots that we've talked about, some of the concepts that we've seen today into a permanent reality? <clears throat> Thank you, Anya. And very briefly, uh, what we need is a demonstration project. I, I think we were, we're not going, we're, it's too early for policy, certainly in Ireland. We need a demonstration project where these principles are seen to be in operation so that then that can become a center that people come to like Rutgers Center. Um, but we need, first of all, we need to implement it in a, a, one or more places and we need to do research confirming for policymakers its effectiveness. Uh, and we need to do that very quickly. These are incredible effects and incredible possibilities. As, as Greg said, if, if we, or, or someone said, if we have had a drug that had these effects, the inventors of that drug would be billionaires. Uh, this, this is an incredible set of opportunities we have. Over to you, Declan. Much, you're much more familiar with the policy area than I am. Uh, I guess um, I see this as a three or four step process. So yes, entirely go off and do something. But in the going off and doing something, do it with formative evaluation built in, ensuring a valuability of what you're doing. Secondly, use theory of change, logic models and service designs to provide reliable evidence of the outcomes that you're achieving. Um, the third one would be to apply implementation science methodology, focusing on the scope uh, and purpose of what you're doing and that getting very focused, having a good research evidence methodology with trials and evaluation, and evidence of the outcomes uh, built into your implementation journey. And then finally, and possibly the most important, you know, just in my experience is to build from the beginning an expert oversight group, which is to oversee the intervention and the evaluation, which is made up of the stakeholders. So you would have practice experts, you would have reps from, from uh, academia, but you'd have decision makers from government on that with you so that you're building a constituency for change you're bringing on them on the journey journey with with us not trying to explain or to convince them after the fact thank you Declan. we have an audience question here for the watches dr ruth Byrne. again you might be brief please but it says 
could um, Greg and Fiona and others comment on how we can work to improve environments that have been designed for older people, and they have that in quotes, but are poorly designed and constructed to support people living with a cognitive impairment present in the community. Also, as older adults with cognitive impairment re-enter our communities, managing their use of masks, are there any recommendations for how we can improve our buildings and environments to make them more mask friendly? Uh, Dr. Rutger or Walters, whoever would like to go first there, if you want to take a wee bit of time on that, please. Uh, what I'd say, first of all, is um, ideally we would get involved in, in the, you know, the master planning, the outset of a building, and then we can get like the best outcomes. But if we have existing buildings, a lot of the work we do is we go and reassess existing buildings and look at how we can use our principles to adapt and adjust. So if you're going to refurbish a building or you're going to implement change within a building, make sure that you keep the key principles in mind. And there's an awful lot we can do to improve the environment. Even simple things like we talked about clutter and noise, you know, just understanding how it's affecting somebody and the impact it's having. You can look at the environment and eliminate an awful lot of the stressors. But it's, it, it, I wouldn't say it's easy to get 100%, you know, kind of perfect, but we can go a long way towards improving the environment by understanding the key objectives and key principles. That, that's um, a lot of the work we do at the moment is just trying to optimize what people currently have if they're about to spend money on a refurbishment because you spend the same money whether you're going to do it inclusive or not so why wouldn't you design it to be inclusive on the refurbishment side and then obviously as Fiona said the layout when you get to sometimes we even on a refurbishment we'll actually move certain rooms around so that it becomes more intuitive and easier to do but on a new build, it really is important to get all of the layout right so it's uh, the wayfinding is easier and so on. And just one comment on the masks. I think the whole COVID situation is going to see an absolute rethink about the whole care um, development. Um, we generally see maybe units with 30 people in them. We've actually worked on a care home where we had units with um, 28 residents living on a floor. And what we've done is we segregated them into smaller units of 12 but actually the plan allowed us to do that. But I think with regards to masks, I think it's about, I don't think there's any ideal solution to this. I mean, visors would be better than a mask because you can see the lips and the, you know, you can interpret a lot of facial expression. But I think what's gonna happen is we're going to see a shift in how we develop and provide residential care for people and the numbers of people. It's very hard if you have an interaction with 25, 30 different people, including staff in a day, it's much easier to live in an environment with a fewer number of people and a fewer number of interactions. And I think the whole COVID thing is going to bring that on. That's okay. And Dr. Rutger, anything you'd add there? Well, it's just something that's going through my mind. I think um, the story of, of Greg and Fiona and my own um, really complements each other. Um, something that I see in, in most of the Dutch uh, nursing homes is that our are the building of the environment and then the using of the environment are two very separate things and which uh, i think it was a re really good case by greg and fiona to make it more uh, intertwined and if you can combine that with some green principles and make it uh, more ready also for uh, the introduction of animals that would of course be be fantastic i think so we live more in harmony with each other and also yeah people can live there comfortably even though you know they have dementia, um, I think that would be fantastic. It's something that I uh, certainly miss in uh, the in the buildings that I work in. That's great. We have loads of questions coming in now. So audience who are asking them, thank you. We will come back to them either individually from our speakers or we'll keep them for the Q and A later. So you'll have heard from our five speakers there in the introduction of how we can be ambitious, innovative, uh, the ideas of nature-assisted health innovation, as we heard from Dr. Rutger, the idea of just simple intuitive design, as, as we saw from the Walches, and how that can be good for independent living. But, you know, the, the knock-on effects of that when it comes to reduced hospitalization. And then we heard from Ian and Declan there just before the break of this idea of a demonstration project, that there has to be some tangible research case studies before you can get to policy formation. We've got five incredible speakers for you now, experts in their fields, who are really going to get to the heart of the why this matters, how it can become possible. Each are going to have five minutes to respond to some of the ideas that you've heard there in the first half. 
And after all five have had their five minutes each, we're going to come back to a Q&A. So I do have all of your audience questions. Keep them coming in. We will come back to them uh, towards the end. Now, first up to provide a response to what we've already been hearing is Bernice Wuerl, is a geriatrician. She's vice president of the state section of the Brazilian Society of Geriatrics. Um, she's director um, in an institute and Bernice participates in support groups for caregivers, family members of patients with dementia, teaching classes with guidance. She's working on a population project to create a friendly environment for people with dementia. Bernice, you're so welcome. Okay, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to be with you today. I'm currently a fellow from GBGI, and it has been one of the greatest opportunities and biggest challenges of my professional life to be involved in this work. Today, I'm pleased to be able to speak to you about what we have been doing in my home country of Brazil. I have been working on an aging population study for the past few years as part of the Veranopolis project, which started in 1994. That year, National Geographic magazine published a beautiful article on longevity around the world. In this work, Veranopolis was highlighted as the place with, with the highest life expectancy rate in Brazil. The small municipality of 26,000 inhabitants is located in a mountainous region in the south of the country, 170 kilometers from the state capital of Porto Alegre which is a large city of 1.5 million. That National Geographic report caught the attention of a group of researchers in the area of, of geriatrics who decided to study the town of Veranopolis at that time. The vast majority of the residents of this region are of Italian re origin, forming a very homogeneous sample. Longevity related characteristics of that, that population were those found in several other areas around the world Describe it as blue zones. They have a varied and high quality food diet with food produced in the residents' own gardens, supplemented with meat from their own farms. Another characteristic is intense physical activity in the daily rural routine of residents, with long walks to meet family members or to solve problem problems in the city center. The population is also made up of very religious communities that value family life, counting on their support all, at all times. Community life is widely collective. Everyone collaborates with each other. With all this, they built a pleasant living environment with a high level of quality of life. From 2014 to 2017, our research team developed their World Health Organization protocols regarding age-friendly cities initiatives. During this three-year project, we had the chance to interview a considerable sample of the age population living there. Our team ensured that elderly people got involved both via the Municipal Council for Elderly People and through public events. We conducted quantitative and qualitative research covering the obstacles and advantages of living in Veranopolis as an older person, addressing issues such as physical space, housing, transportation, participation, respect and social inclusion, communication, learning opportunities, care and support. Through all those interactions, we could listen to their feelings, their complaints and their wishes for the community. Considering the needs regarding physical space and housing, they ask for support services of house repair and maintenance, focus on house adaptation and maintenance of the sidewalks. 95% of them answered that family and close friends are available when they need help, and 88% consider the neighbors to be friendly and helpful. On the other hand, only 50% consider they have access to good nursing homes if staying at home was no longer possible, and 70% said they cannot count on a day center for support in case they need it. Our research also showed the residents in our catchment asked for opportunities to work in schools with activities focused on the integration of younger and older people and for places to share physical activities and to interact with younger generations. I can leave the link to this information in the chat box for those of you who are interested. All the demands from the community were listed and the research findings became the basis for an action plan. An intersecretarial community was 
created and each municipal secretary was responsible for developing a project within the initiative. And lastly, a number of indicators were established, both general ones and specific ones for the various projects of the action plan. It was a pleasure to live amongst them and identify their values. Their dedication to family and community life gave them some just sense of well-being that was contagious. On the other hand, this small town faces the reality of a low-income country. There is no dementia care policy, no dementia-specific training for staff, and no dementia-friendly wayfinding and design. And this is where my next project begins. I'm about to implement a memory clinic, and the next step is to start a discussion with the politicians and community representatives regarding feasible proposals to implement a dementia-friendly place. Because as Professor Kalashi usually says, an age-friendly environment is welcoming and enjoyable, enjoyable for everyone. And the dementia-friendly one is even more. Many thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Bernice, for those remarks and great to hear of another case study all the way from Brazil. Bernice is Vice President, as we mentioned, of the State Section of the Brazilian Society, Geriatrics and Gerontology. Thank you for that. Now, moving next to Professor Suzanne Timmons, who is the Clinical Lead for the Irish National Dementia Office. She's an academic geriatrician in the Centre for Gerontology and Rehabilitation, U University College Cork and Program Coordinator for the MSc Dementia and MSc Older Person Rehabilitation in UCC. Her research includes health service evaluation, planning, and interdisciplinary, dis interdisciplinary research in dementia, delirium, and Parkinson's disease. She was senior author on Clues, A Home for Life Report in 2015. Suzanne, you're also going to respond to what you've heard so far. Yes, so I've really enjoyed what I've heard so far. Um, I suppose I would have looked a few years ago about housing needs for older people in general and a lot of what we've talked about resonates so much. Um, and I suppose within the National Dementia Office we have a focus both on brain health, in other words trying to reduce and prevent and delay dementia and certainly there we would be looking at simple things like exercise and social connectedness and so when we talk about housing as well as looking at the interior which I think we focused on a lot um, and the nature and all which is so important we also need to think about simple things like accessibility and a person getting out and being able to exercise outside and being part of their community so it's important I suppose that we always embed the structure with the person getting out and being part of their community. I think this year with COVID, we've seen a lot that we can overcome some barriers there with uh, IT and people being able to keep connected virtually and you know even participate in exercise classes virtually and things like that. Um, so there's certainly within the National Dementia Office, we have a huge focus on people aging in place and very much staying in their own homes wherever possible. And, and I suppose I would just say we, we've seen some fantastic examples of design and dementia friendly design and universal design. I suppose we always also have to remember that it's a person's home and sometimes we need to be careful not to rush out and to totally change someone's house where every part of it has a memory and evokes memories, which is really good, and where someone's familiar with it. So sometimes I find we can go the other direction. We can rush to future-proof someone's home when they have dementia or mild cognitive impairment. Um, and we need to be careful not to overdo it. So there's simple things we can do with lighting and some changes, mm -hmm. but we need to also always be very individualized in our approach. And then finally, I just say in relation to acute hospitals, we've seen quite change in the last five years in Ireland that a lot of hospitals have now looked at improving their wards. And there's some fantastic examples, for example, James Connolly Memorial Hospital, um, St. James's Hospital, Mercy University Hospital in Cork. Lovely examples of making their wards more dementia friendly, but again, always thinking about universal design. So it's not just a person with a cognitive impairment, it could be someone with a physical impairment or a sensory impairment. 
so slowly but surely I do see an improvement. It does take time and you know we don't expect hospitals to shut wards and to refurbish or to shut a whole hospital and refurbish so we have to keep being able to provide care but whenever hospitals are due a refurbishment or whenever there's new bills we do see more and more that the principles of universal design and being dementia friendly are coming into place and I know Tom Gray will probably say more about that and results of our audit of dementia care in acute hospitals, which did show that actually nearly every hospital in Ireland is at least thinking about dementia friendly design, even though there is a variation in how far along that journey there they are. So they were really my kind of initial thoughts on things and I might come back in later maybe for further discussion. That's that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Suzanne Timmons, clinical lead with the National Dementia Office. Now, moving next to Marissa Plune, who is a lead analyst for the OECD's work on affordable housing, and she manages the OECD affordable housing database in the Directorate for Employment, Labour and Social Affairs. In over 10 years at the OECD, she has worked with national, regional and city governments around housing and urban policies. Prior to her current role, she contributed to the OECD's cross-cutting work on inclusive growth in the Office of the Secretary General. Marissa, you're going to provide also just your thoughts on what you've heard so far, maybe some other ideas for us to consider. Thank you. Um, and thanks very much for the invitation today. Um, I have to say this is not a, a usual event that, I, uh, that I'm invited to participate in, and I am very happy to do so, and I have already learned quite a lot um, in in the hour and, so, and, and change that we've been together. Um, I just want to maybe, um, I think, listening so far and, and thinking about the work that we're doing at the OECD, uh, I see a lot of parallels. One thing I think I can try to um, contribute here would be um, building a bit on some of the things that uh, Greg Walsh mentioned uh, around kind of the scale of the challenge in Ireland um, and sharing some, some information, some data we have just on, on more broadly what we're looking at uh, in, in the OECD and in EU countries. Um, first, just um, we have just recently last week uh, launched a, a policy brief on housing for people with disabilities. So this is a very timely webinar for me. Um, and what we do in this brief is we look at what's, what's the housing situation of people with disabilities, what types of housing supports are available in countries uh, currently, um, and then we provide some recommendations of, of what we think governments can do. So um, just in a first sense, as I said, the scale of the challenge is we're talking about one in four adults in OECD and EU countries who report having some kind of disability. Uh, so this can be cognitive, this can be physical, sensory, et cetera, but one in four, which is significant. Um, and, and as uh, Greg mentioned as well, this is a share that's going to grow in time uh, due to population aging and also due to um, an increase in people um, experiencing uh, chronic disease. So the, the challenge is significant. Um, we also know that this population uh, tends to be older, tends to have lower incomes, uh, tends to live alone, and tends to be overburdened by housing costs, meaning they're spending more than 40% of their disposable income on housing. So to give you just a snapshot of generally on average, um, kind of what some of the, the, the challenges and the characteristics of, of this population. Um, when we talk about people with disabilities, we're taking a very broad conception to this, uh, as, as I mentioned. Um, so that means obviously that when we're thinking about the housing solutions, it's, it's not a one size fits all solution. And we've heard some, I think some really interesting approaches to what that can look like. Um, I think uh, for us, a few things that, that we were seeing consistently and, and kind of persistently ac across countries and across time uh, in terms of the barriers that this population is facing in the housing market. Um, I, I mentioned some of the kind of the, the financial uh, snapshot is, is that they tend to be, have lower incomes, be overburdened by housing costs. So there's, there's first of all, financial barriers just to having good quality housing. The second, in terms of accessibility, and here I was, I was thinking a bit um, about what we've heard as well. Um, in most countries that we surveyed, uh, I mean, the, the housing stock falls well short of, of the kind of accessibility needs 
of, of people with disabilities. Um, but, but in most cases, this is really interpreted and really measured for people with physical disabilities. So we're not really able to know, we don't have the information, we don't have the data that we need to understand um, how the housing stock meets the needs of people with more cognitive, intellectual, mental um, impairments. So that's something we just don't have the information and we really need that information. Um, I think the final thing I would I would say, um, just to kind of, we look, I can provide the, the link to the brief in, in the chat, but um, what uh, I, I really wanted to just kind of two pieces I wanted to focus on right now um, in terms of the recommendations. Uh, the first is that I think um, there's really these persistent knowledge gaps and that's something we've heard from countries. Uh, we don't necessarily, or, or countries telling us, governments telling us, we don't necessarily, you know, we know people have needs, we know they're diverse, but we have a hard time meeting those needs and matching them to different services and, and housing solutions. Um, and part of that is just, you know, the data has gotten better over time, but the data is still really patchy and it's still really outdated in terms of, you know, what people needs and what the housing stock is currently kind of able to provide. Um, and the final point, I think, which really I was thinking about before this um, session today was uh, that there was really a across countries this call for, you know, we know we need, we know housing is not an island uh, in, in any case, you know, for anyone, but I, especially for people with disabilities, for people with different types of impairments, it really can't be. Um, and the need to link housing policies uh, and, and provision with health services, with long-term care, um, um, you know, even with transport, with all of these other pieces of the puzzle, um, there's increasing understanding that that needs to happen. And for the most part, it hasn't happened to the extent that it needs to happen. So that's something that we look at uh, a bit more. Um, there's a lot more I could say, but I think I will stop there to, to leave room for, for questions and more discussion. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was Marissa Pluin, the lead analyst for the OECD's work in this area. Now, next we're going to hear from Nora Owen, a familiar name and face to all of you, I'm sure, as an Irish politician for over 20 years. She was elected to the Dáil 1981, served to 2002. Um, she served as multiple spokespeople over the year and obviously really made her mark as the Minister of Justice. Uh, through the years of 1994 to 1997. And Nora, I wonder there, listening to Marissa, where she talks about that need for joined up thinking between different government departments, if you have some thoughts on that, but also just the financial, the fundraising model that currently underpins a lot of this and what is needed there? And maybe even is there a rethinking needed when it comes to training and education in this whole area? Oh, just on mute there, Nora. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody who's listening. I must say this has been a really informative and, and very useful seminar. And I would like to make the suggestion that if it could be shown to all the private and public owners of nursing homes around the country, it would, I think we would see a difference in what's going on. And if anything has ever shown up the differences in our nursing homes, it has been the COVID epidemic and, and it has meant that some nursing homes have been able to supply good care for their people and others have fallen short of the best care. So I hope that we will have learned from the pandemic how we should be treating people in our nursing homes first. I have kind of become a sort of advocate for dementia, for people suffering for dementia unexpectedly because my own husband Brian um, got dementia about 15 years ago and I became a carer for him and, and therefore I, I have learnt as it were on the job um, and I want to thank the, our speakers, particularly Ian Robinson men mentioned um, rich social connections and I saw that at first hand in the choir we joined, the Forget-Me-Nots choir, where people with dementia were singing with people who didn't have dementia with their carers and other people who just came along to sing. And I know during this last year and a half, those with dementia in the choir have really lost out some of their capacities because we're not meeting. We're meeting on Zoom, but I could never use Zoom with my husband, Brian. He didn't know how to focus in on a, on a phone or on a Zoom. So, so the social contact 
has been a really important element of keeping people as active as possible. So what I've tried to do in my, my time as an advocate is to share some of the things that happen when somebody is going through what they call the journey of dementia. And I've been stopped by people saying, thank God you mentioned the shower. Thank God you mentioned the toilet fa facilities. And I wanted to make a suggestion on you that um, we have the, the disabled toilets all over the place with the picture of a wheelchair. I'd like somebody in this seminar to design a little symbol that we could put on the, the outsides of public toilets um, something that says, if you have dementia, you can use this. Because I lost my husband in a bathroom in a cinema one day and I had to send a young man in to try and find him inside. Um, and he brought him out to me. And after that, I decided from now on, I will use the disabled toilets. And I know people look a bit askance at me when I come out. We both look, we both look fit and able but I needed to be there to help Brian in whatever way I could. So there are things like that. People need to be told as dementia takes hold of your life, there are little adjustments. Put signs up on your kitchen presses to where you keep the biscuits and the cake and the cups and the saucers. Put, put um, an extra banisters on your stairs to prevent falls. Um, make sure that you take the keys out of the door because Brian used to lock me out when I went into the garden. He just turned the keys. Simple little things like that to make your caring facility easier and make sure that you tell at least some of your immediate neighbours that you have somebody in the house with dementia. Because if Brian wandered out the front and a neighbour saw him, I wanted them to know that perhaps they should just direct him back into the house because uh, one of my neighbours did disappear out of the house. And luckily the local shop knew her condition and somebody walked her home again. So that's the kind of thing that we're hearing today helping people to be effective carers. I also will finish by saying, listening to this discussion today, I'm strangely enough going to be 76, my birthday is tomorrow. And when I was 20 and 30, I never heard the word Alzheimer's. I never heard the word dementia. We talked about people who were maybe a little bit soft in the head and various expressions. And I just want to make sure that our training programs for our doctors are keeping up to date on knowing how to help people cope with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's and dementia. I think there's a reluctance of doctors to use that word to people when they go to the doctor. And I think there's a lack of training, perhaps, or a need for more training for the care agencies in the HSE so that the, the public health nurses and the people in those agencies can actually talk openly to a carer about their loved one with dementia and Alzheimer's, because I think there's a reluctance there to use these words. So I, what I've learned today has been wonderful. I've heard all the different aspects of my life in the 12 years that I minded Brian at home. And finally, I'll say one of the biggest and hardest decision is moving from home care into a nursing home or some kind of sheltered care. That's a difficult decision for people to make and they need great support in making that decision. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nora Owen. So many ideas in there for, for somebody with that policy lens that you have and also someone as a carer and very happy early birthday to you. Thank you. you. <laughs> and, and such simplicity of ideas there, just around symbols and visual design that there are simple changes that are quick wins when it comes to all of this. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, our final comments before we go to our Q&A uh, are going to come from Tom Gray. Uh, Tom is a research fellow in the Trinity House Research Centre and works at the intersection of architectural design, urbanism and universal design to examine how the built environment can support health and well-being, inclusion and social participation, creating age-attuned and helpful um, environments for older people is a key research area with recent projects focusing on housing and dementia and dementia inclusive communities. Tom, I hope you're going to bring us through some of those learnings and takeaways. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, Tom. <laughs> there we go. Every time, Anya, every time. <laughs> 
Okay, so yeah, thanks, Onya. Look, over the last seven, six or seven years, we've developed um, dementia-friendly guidelines for housing here in Ireland. And, and with Suzanne, who spoke just a minute ago, uh, we developed uh, dementia-friendly hospital guidelines. And we're currently working on research for long-term care settings. So, so the work is ongoing. Um, but before I, I kind of get talking about Fiona and Greg and Rudger's work um, specifically, I'd like to step back a little bit because something Ian said at the beginning of the seminar really struck me. He, he correctly mentioned that, you know, the people would not associate or might not associate brain health with housing. Um, you know, but in some quarters, the recognition of, of place, design and the built environment is probably as old as civilization itself. The practice of feng shui, pronounce, or forgive my pronunciation, is probably 4,000 years old. Vitruvius was talking about healthy conditions for new towns, 50 BC. And right up today, um, last week, we had the the seventh European Health Design Congress. Um, so, you know, there is a strong narrative about health and place and the built environment. But really, um, and the, the most important development, I guess, is the expanding research and evidence base to inform and underpin design of our physical environments. For instance, the GBHI themselves outline a range of modifiable risk factors that account for up to 40% of worldwide dementia. And these obviously relate to uh, wider brain health but many are related to the built environment, in particular housing, the public realm, mobility, transport, and so on. So all the things that are critical to the functioning of our community, and of course, positive and healthy residential environment. So look, when you look at some of these modifiable uh, factors, we have issues like social, social isolation, often caused by poor housing, something that Respond Housing are dealing with, or a poor or, or a lack of public uh, community space and so on that doesn't support and encourage participation and connections. We have physical inactivity, again, something that's precipitated or exa exacerbated by a poor public realm or a lack of public space that, that doesn't uh, promote active transport. We have stuff like air pollution, a really important issue, and has come to the fore, I think, with, with COVID in terms of the link between um, respiratory conditions caused by pollution and, and COVID. Problem there is car, in particularly in our towns and villages, is car dominance, lack of sustainable and healthy active travel um, um, options. And then something else on, on that list of modifiable uh, factors being hypertension. You know, this might be exacerbated by a lack of physical exercise or influenced by poor local environmental conditions. So all of these are impacted by the built environment, by design, planning and housing. And a lot of these, and, or certainly some of these, were discussed by, by Fiona and Greg and Rutger earlier on. I thought Fiona and Greg's point about dementia inclusive design is, and I'm gonna quote it here directly because I took it down, is the most inclusive form of design as people with dementia can live with progressive compounded physical sensory and or cognitive disabilities. Now that's a really good point. And it starts to show us how design for aging and disability raises the bar for absolutely everyone and creates more inclusive um, environments uh, across the board. Rudger's presentation on nature-assisted innovation was really interesting, and I, I loved um, the fact that he talked about cuddle chickens, um, but he seemed to have a problem with, with rabbits. Um, so, but the highlighting the, the proven benefits of exposure to nature, and he mentioned things like creativity, recovery, eating healthily, exercise, and so on. But I thought one of the really interesting things here was how the introduction of nature um, into a setting helps a, a setting interact a bit more with the outside world through increased volunteering and overall community engagement. So that, that was something that really struck me. So to summarize, I suppose, the presentations illustrate the, the really strong links between our physical environment and our brain health, not just as reactive or prosthetic environments. Mind you, this is really important because as Greg and Fiona pointed out, a lot of our environments don't do those basic things but really as a proactive and healthful environment. And I guess this is where Rudger was going with his nature assisted stuff um, that support and promote uh, brain health right across the life course. So our job, I think as researchers and, and architects and so on in this field is, is to work at providing housing and communities that support all things that support brain health from the moment we are conceived to old age and everything in between. Um, and that's no big ask at all, but I think here at the seminar, we're starting to um, address some of the key questions. So thank you very much for your time.
That's great. Thank you so much, Tom Gray, Research Fellow with the Trinity House Research Centre in Trinity College, Dublin. Now, we have about seven minutes before we let you out into the sunshine uh, for questions. And um, your questions have been coming in uh, for the last two hours, which is really wonderful. Just to say to you, with some questions that we haven't gotten to hear in the conversation, uh, some of the panellists have been in there answering them by text. There's a lot of links for everybody uh, to take a look at. So I do encourage you in the next six, seven minutes, get in there, do your copy and paste uh, as they've been putting them in there and answering them. You'll find about 15 answered questions now in under answered. Um, one of the themes that I feel has been coming through in the questions is around education and how that can create its own barriers to adoption. And one of our speakers talked about, you know, just sometimes there are persistent knowledge gaps. And I wanted to see if, if, if any one of our speakers had some tangible ideas about advocacy, education, what needs to happen there in kind of just often this perception and making perception a reality and how you bring people along. Does anyone want to put their hand up? Because it's been a running theme for a lot of the audience. Tom, you're going to dive in there first. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, as Suzanne said earlier on, look, things have changed. Um, when you look at um, the way, and I'm coming from my own perspective as an architect, the way architectural training is starting to change. I know that in some of the curriculums here in Ireland that they're introducing universal design, inclusive design at an early stage. When I started architecture back in 1992, we weren't talking about those things. So we clearly see, I think, an evolution in thinking. Um, so that's, I think that's just one example of how the message is starting to get through. Anyone else want to pick up on that? I know that this came up earlier for the Walshes, yeah, as one of the barriers. Yeah. Um, I just, it's Greg here. Just, um, I agree with Tom, but what we need to do is, I think it's a specialist branch of architecture because while this looks really simple on the surface, what's happening is it's been deployed very simply. This is all the bright yellows and reds and the naivety of what's going on. And most architects don't want to touch this. They'll, you know, there's guidance in the UK, uh, HBN 0802. And we talk to architects and they say, we put it in as small a part of the hospital as possible because it's so demeaning or it's so ugly. So what we have to be able to do is actually have a very sophisticated understanding of how to apply what looks like something very simple, quite complex, and also how to make decisions as you go through the design process on the trade-offs as you come through each design. So I think in most countries, it should be part of architectural training. And then the other thing is the reason we, one of the reasons we went to the GBHI was to bridge across from architecture into medicine. And we wrote a article recently in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry on the need to bridge convergent science of neuroscience, brain health, architecture, and you know, geriatric medicine. And so that the doctors understood that the environment has a major effect on functional ability. And in fact, we'll see that it's, if you get the environment wrong, it progresses the rate of cognitive impairment and the rate of decline. So it's actually quite complex and it needs to go into both medicine and into a specialty branch within architecture. Nora. Oh, mute there again, sorry. Could I just say, because the minister opened this seminar and I want to make sure that he gets some messages from it as well. Um, there is a need for the Department of Environment or local housing, whatever they call it now, to recognize that there should be incentives for developers developing in, if they're building a number of houses that looking at maybe structuring 30 of those being around a compound with a, with a central building where people can have their meals and get their, their care there. You see, Respond are doing a tremendous job, but there is a problem in, pri in people in private houses trying to, to right size or downsize or whatever the correct word nowadays is. And you can't sometimes put your name down for some of the kind of houses that Respond are building if you have a private, if you are a private house owner. Maybe Declan would, would clarify that. So the department needs to look at encouraging. I've already spoken to developers and said, would you not consider most of the private housing that's available for people who need to downsize or right size is done. Church groups have done it. 
private community groups have done it, but we need to get more of that done by the big developers who are building more planning applications coming in. And that's where Greg and Fiona's designs and Tom's designs could then be sold into those developers. Great. Okay, so question of incentives. There's a question here from the audience that I think is critical that some of you have been touching on. And this audience member asks, excuse me, can we involve service users in design in a more meaningful way? And I think that was the thing that was screaming at me looking at the Walsh's presentation earlier about that in simple intuitive design and just anyone got any key principles that we should be thinking about there from the outside in from people being part of the design process? Um, one of the things we did recently was we did a presentation to the Irish Dementia Working Group and that's a very, I mean the people living with dementia and they give a lot of input into design for the best they understand. But one of the things that they weren't fully aware of, or they weren't consciously aware of the impact the environment has because they're living with a disease that's constantly changing. Mm. And they think it's the disease and them, and it's not the environment. And it's really hard to articulate it because somebody with a physical impairment, if they're sitting in a wheelchair at the end of a flight of stairs, everybody can see the problem and the person in the wheelchair can articulate it. So one of the challenges with this is, yes, you, you do want input from people living with different conditions and diseases, but also to be aware that it's incredibly complex when it comes to the brain, because you, you have to separate out different elements in the environment that cause stress and anxiety versus the underlying disease versus the changing nature of it. And at the end of it, you just say, I can't cope, I withdraw. Or if I'm locked in that environment with soft locks, I deteriorate because I get a functional behavioural response and then I end up with functional decline. So I don't know if that covers the question. Anyone else want to put their hand up for that? We're good. Great. Oh yeah, Tom, thank you. Sorry, yeah, uh, just to build on, on Greg's point there, I think a couple of things. Um, often when you're dealing, you know, or, or liaising or engaging with, with people with a cognitive impairment, you're asking them complex questions about the environment. Um, and there's, there's different ways we can come at that. On our projects, we've done stuff like gardening activities. We've done stuff like baking activities. There's things you can do to soften or prepare the ground. Nora will tell you, we, we've done some dementia friendly garden work. Um, and you know the, the powerful thing about carrying out an activity with somebody is that you get to observe, observe their needs and how they interact with the built environment without asking them to present a brief. So I think we need to be very imaginative in how we um, engage people. But one, one thing I think is important to say, we, I would say that as a culture, we don't have a very strong way to articulate um, the quality of our built environment. Um, so it's not just people with dementia or older people that have a problem articulating quality. In Ireland, we, we tend to have a pretty low bar when it comes to um, our built environment and what we expect. And one of the things, if the minister is listening, we don't have a current um, up-to-date policy on architecture. It's, it's very old at this stage, so I think we need to really start pushing that to get um, high quality design across the board. Okay, thank you for that, Tom. We are on time. Again, thank you so much for all of the questions. I do encourage everyone to take a look at all of the answers that have been provided in there by text. We started at three o'clock saying hopefully this, these two hours will provide for a lot of thinking about the biomedical, social design, community considerations of age adapted living. I think our panelists, our speakers definitely answered that calling. I for one feel much better understanding of that relationship now between brain health and the built environment and how real truly new innovative ideas when it comes to nature assisted health, when it comes to our green innovations, when it comes to our simple intuitive design, of how we can help adults live healthier, happier lives. One thing to say to everybody who's gathered here today, a recording of this webinar will be made available on the respective websites over the coming weeks. So do keep an eye out for that. And um, this is just the first in a series of seminars. So do keep an eye out for updates from Respond and the Global Brain Health Institute over the coming weeks and months. Um, which really just leaves me to say a sincere thanks on behalf of Respond and the Global Brain Health Institute to the Minister for opening proceedings today, Minister Dara O'Brien, to all of our speakers, presenters, panellists and the team at Trinity College for facilitating the event. Um, I think we've been left with a lot of ideas today. 
Ian talked about a demonstration project. Hopefully today is the beginnings of hearing that phrase come back again and again as we try to turn some of these pilots and concepts into reality in the short, medium to long term. So thank you so much to everyone who was engaged today for all of your contributions. Go out, enjoy the sunshine, and we'll hopefully see you all back here again sometime soon. Take care. Thank you.